numerous um, downstream fault lines. Well, the event in January 2011 was statistically significant and provided important calibration data for flood modeling projects we were currently undertaking. It also was a catalyst for us to rethink about the way that we addressed flooding in the planning scheme sense, um, which we're also about to commence on. So as part of the development of the Regional Floodplain Database um, program that Steve Rossford's team has been heading up, um, Council developed this uh, risk management framework. Step one, identify the risk. So that's been undertaken through all the numerous um, RFD models that have been undertaken for all the catchments within the council area. <coughs> Step two was analyse that flood limit risk. So where do we have areas that are um, unacceptable risk? Houses are going to wash away, long periods of inundation or isolation. Um, step three was prepare a plan. And we've done that in an interim fashion for the planning scheme. And we're currently working through a program, it's probably going to take us about 10 years, but we're looking at every single catchment as a whole and looking at it in an integrated fashion between floodplain management, waterway health, waterway quality doors, and um, the environmental functions within those as well. Um, so that'll form our basis of our floodplain management moving forward. And of course, step four in any good framework, actually implement the plan. So for the planning scheme, um, in about 2011 we started drafting the framework. The council set some very key, key targets for us to meet. 70% self-contained employment, diversity of places, integrated transport, increased <coughs> active public transport, walkable and safe neighbor, uh, neighborhoods, uh, healthy and natural areas, and affordable infrastructure. So that's kind of been the driver between how we actually look and uh, respond to things like flood and its impacts on other infrastructure as well as the communities in which they live. So we've used a place types approach. Has anyone heard of the place types approach? The next generation handbook that was produced by the state government. So it kind of looks at um, development as um, every place is unique. Every place has its own character. And just because you're in a centre doesn't mean um, every same element um, is important. So in your rural areas and your um, fringing areas, you may have a higher value to um, your waterway corridors, or you might have water floodplains, you might have important connectors. But necessarily, as you move into that urban framework, your densities increase, um, you've got increase in pervious areas, and we need to treat our response to development and infrastructure in a different fashion. So that's been the basis of how the planning schemes we put together. So flood, 12 months of workshops with council. We went through five scenarios in flood risk, and we looked at it both for river and creek and for um, storm tide as well. So as you can see in the, those last three two scenarios at the bottom of that page, um, we introduced this blue category, which we deem extremely unacceptable. Not just unacceptable, this is really where we don't want to go. So this was the resultant matrix that we um, presented to council and workshop through the planning scheme. Um, the area of most contention was actually uh, um, the H5 PMF. Um, we originally had proposed that to be an um, unacceptable risk for council. And once they seen the extent of the number of properties and the proposed versions were looking at that unacceptable sign, they, um, advised, they requested that we make that into a tolerable risk. So I'll just show you how we, it's actually been applied through the final scheme. This is a sample site. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the bookshop. Um, Bruce Highway is that road on the far side. And this is King Street coming into the Bush CBD. This is actually parcel councils um, purchased recently. So this was the hazard mapping using that risk matrix. As you can see, that blue area through the middle um, is that extremely unacceptable risk moving up to the um, tolerable in the yellow and that green area is the acceptable. And we, this includes land under a PMF event as well. But it wasn't so simple. As you can see through here, we've got um, so the centre of this blue area, an area of elite lower risk. But if we put somebody in there, and it may be tolerable at one event, what do we do if something worse happens? So we went through this lovely long process of looking at puddles and islands. Um, there was 284 islands 
and 251 puddles that were looked at. So of those 284 islands, 20 were classified at a risk level that would um, be significantly low enough to permit development to happen. And of that 251 puddles, only 10 were identified that would allow development. So if we just applied that risk matrix throughout the whole scheme, we would have had potentially some future issues to manage. So how did this turn into zoning? Limited development zone. I haven't actually seen many other schemes that have actually applied the zoning through <coughs> There's codes and things in there, but I haven't seen any zoning that. So we've got in here um, this extremely high risk. So that was that blue zone. So this is our, I guess, our most highest hazard, highest extreme. In this area, we've basically said this is our retreat zone. We've prohibited building works. We've prohibited operational works. We're going to let plantations happen, parks, those kind of things, nice and green. We're going to use it for our offset locations for environmental corridors and carbon and all those other activities. But if somebody's house is there currently and their house burns down, washes away, whatever else, we're not letting them go back. We've got about, I think it's estimated to be about 300 properties in this classification that we're going to go through. And obviously we'll be looking at where the building actually is situated and those kind of things. But this is basically forming our response through the catchment management plan. The next stage, and probably the biggest problem with consultation at the moment, is this high risk. So that next level up, it's still considered an unacceptable risk. And keeping in mind that this area is significantly below a defined flood event. That high risk area, we're basically telling people, if your house burns down or it washes away or something happens, you can replace life with life. You can't increase your, growth, your site area, you can't increase your gross floor area, and you must meet the QDC. set. So we're not making people move out, but we want them to be able to be resilient. Then there was a joyous split zone. So Water Bay's planning scheme was all based on the process of we weren't going to include split zones in the scheme. So when you go and apply these rules across every single parcel and you start looking at percentages of allocations, things like here <coughs> end up being clean zoned. So we came up with a, a few mapping rules to work through. Um, and that included splitting all parcels that were affected by flooding into size categories, whether they were uh, less than 1,000 square metres, um, uh, greater than 1,000 or less than 5,000, and then above that threshold. And then there was some thresholds on site cover. So if we thought we could get a development portion out of a block, we gave a split zone. So from there we move on to the constraints. So there's a few little exceptions to the zoning. <coughs> Things like parks, um, SEQ waterland, extractive industry um, um, were actually excluded from limited development. So it's kind of a layered effect with the zoning. Um, so where we wanted to ensure the parks guys didn't put a toilet block in the middle of a H5 hazard that was going to get washed away in a 10 year event, which does happen, <laughs> we then brought that limited development zone across into the high hazard. So this is this dark room through the middle there. And it also in this instance aligns with the DFE, so that catch along is the DFE. The tolerable zone from that, that hazard matrix is then uh, a medium hazard if it's there and within a defined flood event. And then above that is an acceptable risk. So below the DFE, council's, advice, council's decision was that we weren't going to allow rich, uh, reconfiguration, but if somebody had an existing allotment um, that they hadn't yet built upon, we would allow them to go on, as long as they made full level requirements in the QC. For all the other areas, Everything's almost as normal, except that area that is that acceptable risk or low hazard in the constraint basically gave our guidance of where we would apply um, the free board provisions and fill the blocks for that are resilient and under a PMF event um, or a thousand event. Confusing? Makes sense? Awesome. <laughs> Can you see Queensland Development Code? So the um, yeah, the building the plot lines. So flood 
check. Has everyone seen the flood check reports that Council has available? So, um, so Flood Explorer is out there at the moment and we're using it to death with the planning scheme to help people to understand what that translation of the zone and why we've done it the way we've done it. Flood check property reports, this is just an example of the flood check property reports. So if somebody can go into the flood check, they can type in their address and they can get a property report. And this is what we're currently using in our DA process um, to advise people on a nice easy method for setting their um, floor levels and building heights. So what we're looking at doing as part of the rollout of the scheme is, I'm sorry it's not very clear, but we've got on page for the building development levels. So on here, it's currently got in there um, our current climate flood event, which is the current climate example. And what we're looking what the DFE for the new scheme will be is a future environment. So it's a fully developed catchment, increased rainfall intensification, sea level rise, um, <coughs> blockages, anything else? Yeah. Yeah. So we're planning is the hazard approach for our existing climate conditions, and then we've kind of future-proofed it with the DFE. Is that magic or...? <laughs> <laughs> <How's> that? Hopefully. <laughs> and that's probably really the, um, I guess, the main point of discussion with the Council because we have included that, um, the climate change factor and I suppose when we were going through the workshops with the Council was when a lot of those different advices were coming out from the State Government. We are going to have to include it with 0.8 sea level rise. We didn't include it. Don't. Mayor talking to the Deputy Premier, trying to draft a scheme of apply zoning, um, and fortunately we got through and included it. So it's currently the 0.8 to 2100. Yeah, yeah. We've done, we've got some other layers available with some other sea level prizes, I think it's a 0.4. Said we're looking at doing a, um, a climate uh, press management climate adaptation strategy this for two years, so <coughs> and it will be another reintegration scheme. <coughs> I suppose the, the one thing models are as good as computer models, they can't predict everything. Um, we do have a program of reviewing our models on a two yearly basis, roughly. So the scheme is intended to be a live scheme. It's um, it's web based. It's um, no paper copies. So as a new model is available, we'll be updating our zoning, and that's I suppose pretty relevant in a couple of locations where we know we have local drainage issues now. They have gone in the scheme as a um, limited development zone, but if at some point in the future we do come up with a suitable engineering solution for those areas, that zoning will revert. But it kind of prevents us having to address those issues ad hoc um, on case by case basis. So I guess any questions? Um, there's a few websites there. The planning scheme is out of consultation now until the 15th of August. Um, we'd love to hear submissions, particularly those in support of our approach, uh, <laughs> which always helps. Um, It was a model of it. Um, 2011 in Morton Bay um, wasn't a consistent Q100. Um, we had 100 in, I think, typically in the Caboolture catchment. Um, the North Pine had about a thousand year event. Um, so we had different events across the region. We've got 13 River Capital Morton Basin, so, um, so every event's completely different. It, it might be worth mentioning that I think if, if, you, if you're a bit curious where this will come, if you actually go to your website, there's an amazing array of all the maps that are yeah. the foundation. So, like, it, it's like the different presenters have got their own liberty of how to present tonight, but underlying this is a solid block of work yeah. on looking at flood hazard and going through the risk process. So, if you want to sort of go back to understand where this is yeah. coming from, it, it's certainly all there. It's sort of catchment by catchment, a whole range. It's, 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 totally, it's totally out there what the, the range of foreshadowing. Show will um, impact my yeah. piece, so, 
So that's that's your investment that Steve and his team have done. Yeah. I suppose you've taken that next step. Yeah. I suppose there's some areas I guess where we push the pull to. So there's some areas where the DP has gone up. There's some areas where the DP has gone down. So there's some areas where we never had any data at all. So we didn't know what was happening. Um, so I guess moving forward, as an Melbourne Council, we have finally one platform and one way of addressing it. Um, was previously three very, very different ways. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, with, with the zone that you're saying essentially no change in existing use, but it, it, you, can, you can do things if you don't increase your floor areas, yep. you can raise your floor levels. How's the reaction been to that? It was pretty controversial? Um, if we kept it at site cover, sorry, yeah, we kept it at site cover, so allowed people to put a second story on or those sort of things, we probably wouldn't be getting as many complaints as what we're getting now. Um, and I guess, I mean, we've got areas like beach here and things that are quite heavily affected by river creek flooding, and then those that aren't affected by that are affected by storm tide. Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> which is really, really fun. Um, there might be a few different ways we can look at doing those kind of things um, and how we apply that. Um, I think probably from the storm type perspective, I think that's where most of our um, complaints are coming from. People haven't seen that before. They don't consider it as a, a hazard. It's, and I was talking to one lady today. It's happened five times in the 30 years that she's lived there, but it's a risk that she's willing to accept. So where are we to tell them what's an acceptable risk and what isn't? Um, so yeah, there might be a few of those things that we maybe we just draw the line in the sand and we start working on the next version rather than holding up the scheme in the short term. Do you have focus groups uh, to talk about what's an acceptable level of risk? Uh, with the councils, we did. Um, and we we're on a, a 12 month scheme preparation, so there wasn't that much opportunity to go out to the public. Um, I suppose that's the opportunity now. Um, and I know more about councils are as poor as it is, they, they're the collective members, they're there to represent the community, so that's the way that they approach most of this stuff. Yes, that's a really interesting question. I think it's, you know, risk, risk to whom? Yeah. Risk to the council as an entity versus risk to the community as a separate. So that's been the challenge for the councillors to figure out are they representing the interests of the people or representing the interests of the organisation. Yeah. It's, yeah, that would be a challenge. Mm. And there might be different risk people willing to set for storm tide versus river as well. So we just apply the same for both. Um, but it might be something we'll look at in the future of maybe it's a slightly different profile for the storm tide itself. Yeah. You're saying that it's been like change in the next step? Uh, DFE <coughs> won't change, change unless we look at removing a, a sea level rise from it. So, how has that derived from what you said that you've been able to find a change in the next step? You put some weight for it. And you're also going to account for the valve. Yep. Um, that's obviously the land use. Yep. Yep. Do you allow any development of the top plane at all? No, so um, there's allowed compensatory earthworks um, kind of on the margin of the DFE, um, so that basically regularising allotments, but obviously they've got to understand compensatory earthworks. I suppose the other thing I didn't mention as well too is that um, that whole limited development zone and actually below the DFE, the council's all said, said there's no slum ground construction, so all houses have to go back to basically the Queensland style of construction as well. Um, the mayor is, is very vocal on his hate of turkiness, as he terms them. So, a few of us have been doing a trip around Queensland recently and um, looking at levees, and one of the questions keep people saying is, is a house pad that you raise in the house, and is that actually a levee? Mm -hmm. yeah. But I suppose it's the function of the raised one. It's mm -hmm. yeah, problematic. Yeah, and you start to see it across the front and I know we do have, there's a Two sites where the, the mayor and the director of um, planning and development are quite concerned about the number of these checkiness that we've got popping up and what that then 
with continuous set out, roll out what it does to the rest of the pipeline. We're going to leave it there. That's that's a fantastic sort of insight in terms of how we use the information. And I think you guys are on a bit of a journey, I suppose, understanding what the community might think. So here's Jonathan now. Thanks.